Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Nico Tripsevich, the host of today's show. Ask an Archaeologist is a series of live streamed interviews co hosted by the Archaeological Research Facility and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. In this series, UC Berkeley archaeologists and others who work with archaeological materials discuss their research and answer audience questions. For those of you joining us live today, you can post your questions in the live chat box that you'll find adjacent to the YouTube video. So today we are delighted to be speaking with Professor J. Theodore Pena. Uh, welcome, Ted. Hi. Pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Dr. Ted Pena is a professor of Roman archaeology in the Department of Classics at UC Berkeley. He came to us from SUNY Buffalo in 2009, and he will be presenting Making Sense of Material Culture at Pompeii, which will uh, sh show us uh, some of the latest research results from the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project. So I'm looking forward to hearing about your work, Ted. OK, so I can take it away Yeah. and do screen share here. Okay, yeah, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about a few minutes about what um, I've been up to uh, doing research at Pompeii in the last few years since 2012, and uh, then answer uh, whatever questions uh, people might have. Um, the project uh, is called the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project. Uh, its acronym is, is PALHIP. And uh, what it's concerned with, as I'm alluding to in the slide you have now, is um, the thrust of the project is to st study portable material culture at Pompeii, the small objects that are found in and around the houses at Pompeii and sites immediately outside the town, to better understand the life history of the artifact in the Roman world, um, how things flow through uh, the systemic context from their manufacture to their acquisition to their use, their maintenance, their repair, uh, their recycling, their discard, things of that sort. Um, uh, Pompeii is unusually um, a good place to do this because we have, of course, so many sets of artifacts that were uh, in use at the time that the uh, site was, the, the town was destroyed. So we have an unusual opportunity to study uh, the life history of, of artifacts. And so since 2012, I've been going out with a small team. Here you see uh, our uh, 2008 18 team, actually. Uh, usually four or five people, grad students from uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, what we do is we work in the storerooms at Pompeii, uh, very carefully evaluating and describing sets of objects that are excavated in the past by other projects, because there are endless amounts of this stuff that had never been properly studied. Uh, we're particularly interested in looking at what we call use alterations, that is, um, uh, effects on artifacts that come from their use, uh, sooting on pots, abrasion, dents, things like that, so we can uh, gain some understanding of, of what these items were actually being used for. Um, uh, what uh, I've been doing in recent months, uh, really since the beginning of the year, is uh, doing a deep dive into some of our data, and in particular looking at the uh, sets of artifacts, the assemblages that have come from three modest residences, uh, two of these are inside the town of Pompeii, and one is uh, about 1.2 kilometers uh, farmhouse outside the town. Uh, the first two are in uh, this block I've highlighted for you in red. Uh, Pompeii is divided into nine regiones, and each regio into insulae blocks as a modern archaeological convention. So we're in regio one, insula 11, uh, where uh, we're doing a systematic study of all of the assemblages of artifacts that were found in a series of eight plus or minus residences. Here you see on the right a plan of the insula, the block on the left, uh, a uh, the satellite photo of what uh, you see today with many of the houses re-roofed and, and whatnot. And in particular, uh, we're looking at uh, two properties. Here's a, a table which lays out the names of the different properties and their dimensions and ground floor area and so on and so forth. Uh, we're looking at uh, one, this house, uh, the so-called uh, Casa house of Lucius Habonius Primus that you see here in the north end of the block. Uh, and then uh, secondly, this uh, uh, somewhat smaller residence here on the west side of the block that's referred to as the Casa Imperiale, somewhat um, inflatedly, the imperial house. Um, 
And that, in fact, we should be calling uh, something a bit different. Uh, we should be calling it the, the House of Lucius Caelius Januarius, because as is sometimes the case at Pompeii, and in fact was the case in this other house, Sabonius Primus, we find a bronze seal ring like you see here, uh, which has uh, a name on it. And we can often assume uh, that uh, the uh, name is, uh, is that of the uh, most recent owner of the house at the time of AD 79 when the eruption occurred. So if you look at this, you can see in reverse L in the upper right, uh, Kylie uh, finishing the first row and then Januari in the second row. And so uh, we can surmise that the uh, main resident of this house was a Lucius Caelius Januarius. Now, uh, we do a lot of work with the extant documentation from these houses. They were dug way back in 1960s. The documentation is kind of crummy. We have in the upper right the so-called mysteriously named Quaderni Neri, the black notebooks, which are their uh, day books. Uh, and then uh, we also have the standard catalog card, the Scheda Buffetti, named after the standard chain of stationers in Italy, Buffetti, uh, which is produced for each uh, inventoried object. So we work with those, then we work with the objects. Um, uh, a lot of the excavation done back in this time was not up to modern standards, and so often we're dependent upon things like these published sketches at the time of excavation, showing us two views of the courtyard uh, in the uh, uh, Casa di Caelius Januarius that you see right here, um, showing us pottery because while at that time the archaeologists would collect artifacts in metal and in glass and things like that, they considered pottery was kind of boring. And so they would gather it all up and send it off to the vast storeroom with the Granada del Foro, like you see right here. And they would save it, but they wouldn't um, indicate where it came from. And so for these couple of houses, we have actually very little of the, uh, the pottery uh, assemblage uh, to work with, which in a way can be a good thing for reasons I discussed in an earlier lecture at the ARF. Uh, but this storage facility is kind of like, uh, it's right off the forum. There are always mobs of tourists hanging on the grate outside at Staring Yang. It looks kind of like the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark with thousands of these vessels. Um, we also, uh, besides looking at portable artifacts, we recover a lot of indirect evidence for storage furniture, because I'm really interested in these last few months understanding how Romans uh, situated things, how they dispose them around their houses so we can better understand um, that uh, aspect of, of Roman culture. So we find stuff like what you see here, uh, bronze fittings, which tell us about the storage furniture in which a lot of this stuff was actually being stored. So at the top, you have a big uh, 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 flat hinge, strap hinge. Uh, below that to the left, you have a angled overlay hinge, which might have been used, let's say, for the top of a trunk. You have the far right, a, a ring pole that you could use to pull out a drawer or a door. And at the bottom center, what you have is an iron, uh, rather a lead deadbolt uh, from a slide lock, which were often mounted in these storage cabinets and things like that. We can see a little bit of actually iron transfer and wood transfer on it. So using this kind of stuff and then uh, other evidence we have for actual Roman storage furniture. And here you see uh, uh, some casts in the uh, house of Giulio Polibio at the bottom and a detail of one of those plaster casts made where they found the wooden voids where these storage uh, units had been. Uh, and on the upper right, you see a reconstruction of one of these, uh, this today in a, in a museum in Rome. So we're paying particular careful attention to understanding the, the storage furniture inside which these objects were being stored. Um, and we also find evidence for smaller storage boxes of the kind you see indicated here in a reconstruction at the top left and right, and then in a uh, Roman fresco at, at the bottom. Uh, so we're trying to figure out like where Romans really were keeping things and where they would put them and issues of, of that sort. Um, the other structure outside Pompeii, uh, here we have a, a <clears throat> satellite image which shows you Pompeii with the green push pen and then up to the upper left, 1.2 kilometers, not quite a mile away, is the so-called Villa Regina a Bosco Reale. And this was this modest farmhouse that was excavated in its entirety a bit later, right? The other houses were in the 1960. This was excavated in 1978 to 80, by which time they'd made a lot of progress in bringing excavation uh, methods up to more modern standards. Here's the farmhouse as it's been re-roofed in this gigantic hole in the ground because they excavated also the fields immediately around it, which produced a lot of interesting evidence as well. Um, and here's a, a plan of that farmhouse, a big central courtyard with some giant wine storage dolia in it, 
uh, with various uh, residential and, and uh, uh, farm produce processing rooms uh, spread around it. Now, here we have quite different opportunities. Here's a view of the main storage room where the archaeologists actually were able to take plaster casts of shelves on the wall and a storage unit set on the floor and actually recover the sets of objects that were being uh, disposed on uh, in each of these areas. And so we're doing a lot of work with this to understand um, how Romans were uh, placing things around uh, their structures so we can situate what we have. Um, I've more recently been doing some work with understanding the, the flow of objects in and around uh, Roman houses. So here you see a plan of one of those two houses uh, inside the town we just talked about. Uh, this is uh, uh, Habonius Primus. Uh, the number at the top of my slide is actually wrong. It should say 11158, not 17. My apologies there. I'm indicating you to you the three areas that produce large selections of artifacts, probably placed in, in storage furniture. And so I'm doing things like using a technique that's used by architects, uh, creating access graphs, justified access graphs, which help us understand the spaces in a structure and how they're connected and how people can move into and, and through a structure from the outside. So here you see a justified access graph for this house. Um, but I'm tweaking it a bit to sort of pay attention more to how objects could circulate around a house. And so uh, I call these uh, uh, modified graphs that I'm making, justified material culture access graphs. And here you see one of those that I've worked out, uh, worked up for this house to give you some sense about how I'm trying to understand um, how people could actually uh, uh, gain access to things and thus why they were putting them uh, where they were in, inside the house. Um, I've got a bunch more slides that uh, go on and look at individual artifacts from the house. It may be that those are worth looking at in a conversation. I think I've probably spoken long enough. So I think what I need to do now is maybe stop the slide share and uh, go back to my interlocutor so we can uh, address some questions that people might have. Sure, well, um, we actually have a, a few questions coming in now. One of them is about some of your slides. So mm -hmm. it might be worth keeping the Going back to screen presentation share. Okay. on. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, read the question here. Uh, what is the glass object that was shown at the start of the presentation? Uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure I can get to that very quickly or efficiently. Um, that's mm -hmm. a small blown glass vessel uh, that's um, uh, mimicking a, uh, a wine skin in shape. So it's called an askos. We use the Greek word for that. Uh, but this object is actually quite small. It's probably only about, oh, let's say six inches long. And so it's probably a little miniature um, single serving uh, uh, wine pitcher, I suppose you can call it, but it's, it's in the form you see of a, of a, of a little wine skin. That's why oh, it's got that floppy shape. Yeah. And it has, does it have like a, a pointed end to, to mimic? Yeah. Let me see if I can go can back to it. it here. It's all the way in my title slide. It'll take me a while to get there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, as I indicated in my abstract, but didn't have time to get to in particular, I've, I'm, I'm a pottery specialist, but I've spent much of the, uh, 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 shelter in place time, uh, trying to uh, expand my knowledge of, of Roman glass, which is a quite different specialization. And I'm, I'm kind of getting there. Uh, so this is a little tiny, uh, here we go, uh, blown glass vessel. One of the interesting things is that um, one of the very few technological innovations that we see occur in the Roman world is the blowing of glass, which is invented sometime, discovered sometime around the middle or third quarter of the first century BC. Um, we're about a hundred years after that. Uh, and one of the things we can do with glass assemblages at Pompeii is see how the, the suite of techniques that come to represent glass blowing as we've known it now for many hundreds of years are kind of first elaborated. Uh, and so um, uh, glass blowing seems simple and natural to us, but it actually was kind of a tricky thing for people to figure out how to do and how to do well. Uh, and so this is an example of a, of a fairly uh, early on uh, blown glass vessel. Uh -huh. Well, that seems like a, a subject that's ripe for some ge geochemical study. Perhaps we can XRF the earlier and later phases of the glass production. Yeah, one of the tricky things, though, is that um, raw glass is only made in a couple of places in the Roman world. 
uh, in Egypt and in uh, Syro Palestine, and that has a very particular uh, stable isotope fingerprint for each of those areas. And they would get shipped around the Roman world, but the Romans would intensively recycle glass. Mm -hmm. And so what you get are these, uh, the, the secondary workshops could use uh, virgin raw glass from one of those areas or recycled glass or some combination of that. And so what we're learning is, is that the, the, um, the chemical fingerprints of glass don't really tell us very much because it's all stuff that's mixed around. I see. Um, so I want to remind our viewers that they can post questions to the YouTube live chat comment uh, box and uh, we'll present them to our speaker. We're speaking with Ted Pena from the UC Berkeley Classics Department. Uh, here's another question that's come in. Can you speculate about the rope work and knotting use in the furniture? It doesn't survive, but is it likely there was a lot of bags and nets and pulleys? Well, hmm. I wouldn't think so much in storage furniture, but for things like beds, for example, from which we have some um, uh, very nice specimens from Herculaneum where the wooden furniture was kind of um, flash carbonized. And so uh, instead of finding voids where it rotted away, which you can try to recover through casts, at Herculaneum you actually have the original furniture. Um, and there you can get, get a much better sense about these sorts of things. And so it is clear, for example, that there were wooden bed frames which then had uh, um, rope um, uh, crossing between holes drilled in the frame, you know, as the support for then the mattress that would have, have been on top of that. So um, we're not finding that evidence directly at Pompeii, and I wouldn't expect much of it to exist for storage furniture, cabinets and armoires and chests and things like that that interest me. Um, that's more an issue of um, typically bronze hinges and latches and locks and pulls sometimes iron used for that. And also the hinges for boxes and smaller chests were also made out of animal bone. And so we, we do find that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we have a question here about the working at Pompeii. Yeah. Uh, you have a sense of how many different projects are active at Pompeii these days and, and how and if you collaborate with other projects? Well, that's a tough question in, in part because um, of the um, American academic calendar, uh, where um, I can work in Pompeii kind of in June or July, uh, August, everyone's on vacation, so you can't really work then. Um, and most European academics don't start up again, maybe until the end of September, or October, so they often prefer to work at other times of the year. Mm -hmm. So I will overlap with a certain number of projects who are there when I'm there, but there are many others that could be going on that I would not know about. Pompeii is a very, very large place. The area inside the walls is uh, 65 hectares. So multiply that by two and a half if you uh, want to get your acreage. Um, but uh, I certainly um, uh, have relations with any number of other projects from many different nations uh, that are involved working there. Um, we see each other socially quite a bit. Pompeii is a smallish town, so we'll go out for dinner or have a July 4th party for the Americans or or because there are various other American projects working there. Uh, but I have Italian colleagues and British colleagues and Spanish colleagues and Finnish colleagues and uh, people from many, many different countries, principally Western Europe and, uh, and North America. And you perhaps have symposia and conferences where you get together and chat about your findings? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, for instance, a couple of years ago, we had one on uh, uh, recent discoveries about the production of pottery at Pompeii, uh, where in uh, one of the sub-projects we did, we were actually a big garbage dump thrown over the wall um, that had been studied in the past, and we pretty quickly figured out that this garbage dump com contained a lot of waste or pottery, pottery that was misfired, that hadn't been kind of understood as such by the earlier archaeologists who worked on it. And so what we think we have is uh, uh, refuse middens that have, of stuff dumped over the wall that had a, a very small percentage of materials that must have been deriving from a workshop somewhere, probably at no great distance. And by looking at their rejects, we were able to uh, come up with some understanding of the, the suite of forms that they used. Uh, and here we did uh, collaborate with uh, archaeologists from the University of Naples, uh, 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 Federico Secondo, uh, an archaeometric unit there 
uh, to actually do uh, compositional and physical characterization of these so we could better understand the raw materials being used and how they were being processed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, here's another question. Can you tell us a little about the, how you use the plaster casting that you mentioned? Well, I, I, I don't do it, but this is a, a technique that was discovered in uh, Pompeii in the mid-19th century, actually, that, um, uh, that the archaeologists kept finding these strange voids, and sometimes the voids would have artifacts associated with them, and, and um, uh, it was finally figured out uh, that what these were were, in effect, casts that were left where organic material had been surrounded in the lapilli, which had sort of solidified. The organic material decomposed, uh, except for the hard parts like human bones that would fall to the bottom of this void. And if you tapped into the void and uh, just cut a little hole into it and then poured liquid plaster inside, let the plaster set and then excavated away the lapilli, what you would have is a cast of what was there. It could be a dead person or a dead animal. It could be a piece of furniture also. Um, in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, our, the archaeologists there got the idea of uh, using kind of a uh, uh, a resin to do this rather than plaster, reasoning that the resin would be a lot lighter and more ro robust than the plaster, plus it was transparent so you could kind of see stuff trapped inside it. Um, and uh, what's emerged in the last few years is that uh, this resin isn't stable, it's starting to get cloudy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it no longer has some of the uh, positive attributes. But, uh, but I don't do this, but it's, it's a technique that's been done at various points in the past, uh, and it allows you to do things at Pompeii, like if you're careful and lucky, to take casts of, of furniture, although there's mm -hmm. been so much of that done. It's been done more with animals and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have heard of people using 3D laser scanners as well now to, rather than casting, they actually scan the, I guess they're scanning the casts and then yeah. 3D printing the replicas. I suppose if you could introduce, uh, you know, a scanner into a void, you could try to scan the inside of the void. I guess the dentists now and internists and people in medicine have kind of techniques for doing that, but that's, that's right. pretty big budget kind of stuff compared to um, uh, our uh, very, very modest archaeological budgets. <laughs> that's right. All right, here's another uh, question about one of the slides you showed. Mm -hmm. The amphora are often pictured piled and stacked in ways that involve sawdust or dirt. I wonder if a lot of it could have been suspended in slings or hammock-ish rope work. Well, uh, you're probably, let me try to get to that slide. Uh, you're probably referring to the fact that uh, many classes of amphorae, here we go, um, like those in the bottom row here, uh, terminate in a, a point or a spike or a toe, as we call it. Um, others, are like you see in that second shelf up are actually flat bottomed amphorae. Uh, and uh, moderns are often puzzled by the uh, pointy amphorae. They think, well, you know, gosh, that doesn't make sense. They'd fall over, right? So maybe your question is getting on with that. Um, we do know that they were simply leaned against things like you see here. Uh, they could be set in a hole in the ground. Uh, there could be terracotta rings that they could be set into. Um, they're principally containers for shipping, and so when you're trying to uh, lade them, that is put them as cargo, pack them onto a ship, um, actually having a point is an advantage because the, they're being put against the planking of the hull, which is curved, and a big flat bottom wouldn't fit against that so well, whereas a point just touches it in one area. You pack them together really tightly, but you place in between them dunnage, some kind of soft object like a rag or a, a pine bough or something like that. So when the ship sails and start, the cargo starts to shift, they're not going to rub against each other and start wearing holes in each other. So by the end of the voyage, I have a bunch of empty amphorae. Uh, so they would be packed together uh, like that. Uh, and um, so, but I guess one final point is that that point, besides being good for um, uh, using amphorae as, as, as cargo on ships, is also really a third handle. Uh, and so they'd be sealed up. And so you could grab it by one of the, the two regular handles, grab it by the spike at the bottom and heft it up and put it on your shoulder and carry it on your shoulder, holding onto that spike as a third handle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, they were uh, a very intelligent design also for this reason. Um, if they had compact handles that didn't stick out, you could also put them down and you could roll them like a barrel on wharves and stuff like that. 
Uh, at least people are suspecting that now. We don't have any direct evidence for that. Yeah. And I know that uh, high quality wine has a punt in the bottom of the bottle and that concentrates the sediments around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that has a similar function. Uh, probably so. I, I did some work with a, 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 a winemaker outside Portland, Oregon, who makes his own big terracotta. Uh, he calls them amphi, but they really would be called a dolium, a big Roman storage jar. Um, and I spent some time talking with him, and it turns out that the, the shape of the jar in which you're um, fermenting your wine uh, actually conditions the circulation of the must and then uh, 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 forming wine inside. Uh, and so it matters quite a bit about what the actual curvature of the wall is and, and things like that with respect to the, the, uh, how the wine is gonna, gonna ferment and, and the sort of product you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, the, the form of these things would, would have mattered probably for, for that reason as well. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we have a few more questions here. Sure. Was there a standard set of pottery vessels that you find in all or almost all houses? And if so, what does it say about the activities of the house? Well, um, yeah, that uh, in Roman Italy, there are basically three main kinds of cooking vessels that we find in ceramic. Uh, there's a ola in Latin, a cook pot, uh, which is a jar shaped thing. Uh, there is a uh, casserole, which in Latin is called a, a cockabus, and then there's a uh, uh, kind of a, a uh, flat pan. Uh, and those are your three recurring forms you find over and over and over again. 98% of cookware assemblages are those, well, together with the lid that goes on the cook pot, but not on the casserole or the pan. Well, sometimes on the pan, there's some big lids as well. Um, and so there seem to have been these three distinct operations. And by looking at the sooting that we find, uh, uh, this use alteration on the exterior of both ceramic and also these vessels are made in sheet bronze as well. On, on sheet bronze examples of these, um, we've been able to tell a bit about how they were used in the sense that uh, the casseroles have uh, pretty uniform, thick, dark gray, black sooting all the way around, which suggests they were probably set up on a cooking stand of some sort where the tip of the flame, where the soot is, is going all around the exterior. The cook pots, on the other hand, show that type of sooting in the middle and upper part of the wall and even all the way up to the rim. But the underside of the base and the lower wall has like a very powdery uh, light gray transfer. And that pretty clearly is ash. And so it looks like those are being set directly in the embers, very often kind of sidled into the cooking fire from the side because they often just have one handle on one side mm. and the sooting goes way up the opposite side. And so we're beginning to also be able to work out a little bit about how, um, how these different forms were, were used. Um, there's much more we have to learn though from studying, for example, absorbed residues and uh, things like that, which will allow one to answer that question a bit better. But I will also point out that we find this suite of forms in both um, ceramic and in sheet bronze, the latter is probably an upscale version of this. Um, and um, I'll just point out that one of our grad students in classical archaeology at Berkeley, Aaron Brown, is uh, even as I speak, working on a PhD dissertation, which is flowing out of this research at Pompeii, where he's looking at the actual material culture of, of food preparation at Pompeii, so we can uh, really uh, do a much, much better job of, of posing intelligent questions to this. Aaron's a very accomplished cook and, and connoisseur of uh, food and, and cooking uh, and thus come up with better answers uh, than I'm able to give you right now. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a question about the jewelry. The, yeah. How are such small objects such as jewelry, cameos, beads, uh, how are they preserved and stored on site? Well, um, a lot of the um, finds that are um, perceived as being uh, valuable, things made in silver and gold, for example, um, are, I, I can't go into too much detail about this. I'm sure the people at Pompeii would not want me to divulge overly much. Um, those are stored under special secure um, uh, arrangements, uh, often in the, the, the Museo Archeologico uh, 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 Museo Archeologico Nazionale a Napoli, the big National Archaeology Museum in Naples, mm -hmm. uh, or in secure facilities on site. Um, 
Other things that you might find, uh, beads, for example, or, or pendants in materials like glass paste or, or faience, uh, which we also find, uh, or uh, shell, uh, are regarded as less prone to theft. And so those are stored in the regular storerooms together with materials in glass and bronze and pottery and uh, animal bone and things like that. Mm -hmm. And do do materials from Pompeii stay in the in, in Naples or in Italy or are they scattered around the world in many different museums? Well, uh, uh, in the 19th century, when there's a lot of excavation going on in the area around Pompeii, sets of materials from farmhouses found their way to places like the Chicago Field Museum, for example. Um, but uh, in the 20th century, one could not legally export things uh, from archaeological sites in Italy. And so by and large, the lion's share of that material uh, is now in Italy. Um, the bulk of it will be uh, stored in the uh, Art National Archaeological Museum in Naples or um, uh, in the what's now the Parco Archaeologico di Pompeii, the archaeological park of Pompeii. That's what the, the site is now called, uh, where there uh, is now an, an antiquarium on site. Uh, they have a satellite antiquarium at, at uh, Bosco Reale, for example. And so uh, many of the objects will be stored and a very, very small subset of them will be displayed uh, in those venues. Mm -hmm. And there also are, I should say, are frequently um, on short-term loan to uh, museums all around the world in connection with particular exhibits that are organized in collaboration with the Archaeological Park of Pompeii. So these materials do travel uh, but that they need to go back to uh, to the uh, archaeological superintendency of, of uh, Pompeii. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it looks like we're we're almost out of time here. Let me just put the last question to you. The seal ring doesn't look very ornamental. Would that have been worn every day? Oh, uh, well, uh, I don't know. I can claim how this was um, carried around. Um, I, I wouldn't think that you know, you'd be out walking around all the time with this on your uh, on your finger. That uh, the 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 ceiling surface there is uh, a few centimeters wide. It'd be very unwieldy. So I expect you might you might if you were carrying it around. I suppose you might um, uh, wear it on a lanyard or something like that and pick it up and use it. Um, and uh, this presumably is used for. Um, sealing in wax or plaster or clay or something like that to, to show your ownership of whatever is being sealed by that. This particular seal ring was found as an isolated find on the floor of the atrium uh, of this house. Uh, oh no, actually no, that's the, from the other house. This one was actually found in um, a mass of objects being stored underneath the staircase in the atrium of this house. Uh, Romans like us understood that areas under staircases are kind of wasted space unless you have like Harry Potter living there. Uh, and um, they tended to um, take advantage of that for storage. This was found stored with a bunch of other stuff under the staircase. Um, so my guess is, is it probably stayed put and you took it out when you needed it for some particular reason would be my guess. Yeah, I imagine it would be like a notary's stamp. Yeah, yeah. Valuable like that. It's not like your passport. You're not carrying your passport around with you all the time, are you? Only when you particularly need it, right? Uh, so it's totally a guess. I don't really know. Uh, uh, I don't know to what extent, for example, if you look at all of the uh, nearly 2,000 deceased Romans that have been found uh, in the area around Pompeii from the 87 eruption, how many of them had on their person a seal ring. But on the other hand, they were hightailing it out of town. Uh, with maybe their most precious objects. So even that might not be particularly indicative of what was normal um, usage. That's right. All right, well, thanks very much, Ted. It's been really interesting. Okay. Um, and I wanna thank the listeners and viewers and people who sent in questions. And I wanna invite everyone to um, join us next Tuesday on June 7th at noon for a talk entitled Unfinished Business, Completing a Long Forgotten Archaeology Project in Afghanistan with Dr. Mitch Allen. So uh, please join us then. Um, our speaker today, Ted Pena, has agreed to field questions in the future. So if you feel free to post questions to the comments field of this video and we can um, 
Brecht and uh, Dr. Penyon. Um, and also we have a feedback form in the description of this video. So if you'd like to provide feedback about our series, uh, please pull out that form. Thanks again, Ted. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your attention.